Welcome to What a Creep, the show with Margot Donahue and Sonia Mansfield talking about creeps from the past to the present. This is your quick guide to the biggest creeps, jerks, assholes, and losers, the best of the worst. From two nice ladies who want the world to be a little less creepy. Welcome back to What a Creep. This is Margot Donahue, and my cohort in creepitude, as always, is the amazing Sonia Mansfield. Hey, Sonia. Hello, my friend. Hello, my friend. If we sound a little different, I don't know if y'all know about this thing called Mercury and Retrograde, but <laughs> <laughs> it's sudden the cosmos decides that everything electrical can go haywire in your life. And Sonia is going through that right now with her home in San Francisco. Yes, they are doing electrical work. I should say my landlord is doing electrical work on my house. So I have been um, displaced. I think that's a good way of saying it. And I'm staying with my parents. So I am locked away in the quietest room I could find in their place. But I do have my fancy mic, so hopefully I sound okay. But if you hear murder shows in the background, (laughs) they are home because they are retired. And they're watching... They're watching their murder shows. <laughs> so you guys, thank you so much for checking us out today. Our creep today is Charles Lindbergh. We will get to him in a second, but I just wanted to let you guys know that uh, we have a new Patreon member, Annie. Annie, thank you so much for signing thank up for you, Patreon. Thank you, Annie. Yes. On Patreon, we put out bonus episodes. We will put out one this week. We put them out about twice a month, and it's basically where... I should, by the way, say we use salty language in this program. If you don't like cursing and things like that, (laughs) forget about it here. But we really we shoot the shit when we do those episodes. And we've got a lot of really cool topics to talk about for our next episode. Thank you guys so much for being patient. If you want. Thank you. Thank you. We want to thank the people who send us five star five iTunes reviews, including 248 Field, Sean Runs, Mr. Drew Hubby. And Olive, I'll, I'll thank you. You gave us five stars and a tongue lashing, but okay, I'll take it. <laughs> we'll take it. It doesn't hurt our average, so okay, thank you so much. We're, you know, we're okay with that. We're cool. We're cool. Yeah. We do have a basic Facebook page, I should say. You can try reaching us there, but we don't really respond to it. We have a Facebook group. You have to ask to join the group. People don't like it when we use the word juggalo. So what are we saying now? If you don't look like a total you'll creep. You'll storm the Capitol. You'll storm the Capitol <laughs> on January 6th. If you don't look like that, you'll pretty much get into the group. And we're much more interactive there, which we really appreciate. We are on Twitter at CreepPod because somebody had what a creep on Twitter for 10 years and never used it. Creep. We are on Instagram at what a creep podcast. We have a basic old timey email, what a creep podcast at gmail.com. Just spell that all out. We have stickers. If y'all would like some stickers, just send us a note. We will drop them in the mail for you. And Sonia, do you want to tell them about the website? Yes, it's at what a creep podcast.com. And it's everything you ever wanted to know about our podcast, but we're afraid to ask. And it also has a link to our merch shop that has t shirts and tote bags and journals and i uploaded some new designs for masks if you want new face masks and they're really great they're really soft and i like those masks a lot and i ordered some for myself so go check it out all righty so are we ready to talk about our creep today yeah let's do it it's an old timey creep dateline 1927 (laughs) charles limberg lands in paris (laughs) I love your old-timey voice. I love doing my old-timey voice. Charles Lindbergh is one of the most important aviators in the history of flight, not just on Earth, by the way, also space, where he is one of the grandfathers of the U.S. space program. He went from being a national hero to an international disgrace and back to hero status in his 72 years of life. He was handsome, eloquent, and brave. He spoke about, he spoke about, excuse me, he spoke about old fashioned American values and the importance of living a curious life. Lindbergh was also a racist, sexist, anti Semitic asshole who believed in eugenics and preserving a master race. Uh. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. When he died, he was considered a legend who was a devout conservationist and hero. In this episode, we will dive into the world of Lucky Lindy a nickname he hated, so I will be using it throughout the episode. (laughs) 
<laughs> awesome. And the almost scary way he almost changed the entire course of the world. We will get to that. My sources today, I want to say I was partly inspired by people in the Facebook group. Thank you guys for suggesting this episode. Also, HBO has a show called The Plot Against America. It's a six-episode series that came out last year, which imagined a world where Lindbergh won the presidency in 1940 and FDR lost, and then what would happen? And it'd be a fucking nightmare, turns out. So it's interesting. It's on HBO Max if you're looking for something to binge. My sources are Decider, the Wikipedia page for Charles Lindbergh, of course, History.com, the Minnesota Historic Society, even they don't like him. <laughs> He's like one of their own. Smithsonian Magazine, the book The Rise and Fall of Charles Lindbergh. I really loved that. Also, The Angry Days by Lynn Olson. There's the Who Killed Lindbergh's Baby. It was a PBS Nova documentary. It was fancy. Mm, that I would like. Yes. And then History Channel, The Secret Lives of Charles Lindbergh. Let's get going. Charles Augustus Lindbergh was born February 4th, 1902 to Charles August Lindbergh and his second wife, Evangeline Lindbergh. His father, by the way, his father's father, left Sweden. He was going to be arrested for a murder charge, so he snuck to America and never had to face charges. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Cool. Yes. A Nordic person sneaking into America and then just having a fabulous life. His father, Charles August, he was a United States congressman from Minnesota. He did many things, but that was one thing he was mostly known for. And his mother was a chemistry teacher. He was the only son for them. His father had a previous marriage. Both believed in treating Charles as if he were special. And his education was at best peripatetic, meaning that he went to about a dozen different schools before he was 18. They would spend part of the year in Washington, D.C., and then they'd come back to Minnesota, mm, and they'd okay. be in St. Louis. So it was that kind of thing. His father was a very big anti-war interventionist and was outspoken about America appearing in what was called the Great War at the time, World War I. His father had a book called Why Is Your Country at War? And it criticized the nation's entry into the war and was seized by federal agents under the Comstock Act, if you wonder what that is, that is when they get rid of obscene and morally irresponsible materials. Normally that means like nudie books and comic books, but this was also <laughs> one of them. Nudie books. I love nudie books. Anyway, it was later posthumously, posthumously reprinted and issued in 1934 under the title Your Country at War. This is after he died and his son became a superstar. Or What Happens to You After a War? Charles has an early appreciation for mechanics and how things work. He went to over a dozen schools, like I just said. He never really had a lot of close friends. He was very awkward and shy. And his parents encouraged him intellectually, so much so that they encouraged him to drive the family car because he was just interested in how motors work, and he was about 12 years old. Hmm. He attended college, the University of Wisconsin, for just over a year when he was 18, but he did not like the rigid formality of learning in a classroom. It just wasn't his thing. He didn't know how to do it. He's, Everybody learns differently. They do, and I appreciate that. And his parents totally understood how he liked to learn. He stood out because he was so damn tall. He was six foot three. He oh, was yeah. Very quiet, handsome, not much of a drinker. Oh, and his mother moved in with him to the campus. <laughs> That's my mom. <laughs> That's my mama. She's my roommate. <laughs> what is that weird? The one place you can go to be an adult, you know, yeah. to drink and go crazy. And he's like with his mother. Coming this fall to CBS. <laughs> Charles Lindbergh and Evangeline. And mama. <laughs> Lucky and mama. <laughs> Lucky mama this fall on ABC after according to Jim. <laughs> He and his mother were very close, but there was never any open affection between him and his parents. He was a very stoic Swede, as I wrote. If you see pictures of Lindbergh with his mother, like he just completed this huge event, you know, flew across the Atlantic and the, and the reporter's like, hug your son, hug your son. And they're standing like a foot apart from each other. <laughs> nope, She's like, nope, yeah. nope. What, you think you're fancy now? <laughs> 
He also was really into what was happening was a was flight training planes. So Lucky Lindy joins a barnstorming tour, which went all through the Midwest. And basically, it was this aeronautic circus. They just put people in airplanes, strapped them to the top, and just flew them the fuck around. And there was a crowd on the ground. And if you lived, awesome. If you died, too bad. You've got 10 other people who will take your position. And too bad, so sad. Too bad, so sad. And the air... Airplanes were fairly new, and there weren't that many flight schools in the early 20s, so that for him was how he basically learned how to fly. He really took to it quickly. We should also say, we were raised to think that like the Wright brothers and Lindbergh was only like white men that flew planes. It's not true at all. There are plenty of people of color, plenty of women, but all of that is kind of pushed aside for that whole male idea. And he was totally the perfect embodiment of all of that. Like I said, super tall, handsome, laconic, you know, quiet. Anyway, he was a major pilot and had a job for a while helping move the U.S. mail in the newly created U.S. mail army service. So airplanes were now being used to transport things, including the mail. And what happened was the major airlines rented their planes to the U.S. government. And that was really costly. He had a big problem with Franklin Delano Roosevelt because Roosevelt wanted to cancel those contracts and just have the government have their own planes. And he and Lindbergh had like a a conflict about that. But then the planes kept crashing into mountains and stuff. So he had to go back with tail, tail between his legs and go back to like the regular airlines. Anyway, that's another thing. In the 1920s, new air records were happening all over the world, and Lindy wanted to be famous for doing something that had never been done before. He wanted to to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. There had been other people who had done it, but they've done it in pairs. Hotel owner Raymond Ortigue from St. Louis, he offered $25,000 to the first person who could make that flight between New York and Paris. That is almost $400,000 in today's dollars. It's a shitload of money. Yeah. There were some attempts, but nobody was successful until Lindy. And he had a lot of ties to St. Louis businesses and businessmen. So they supported him. And the plane was called the Spirit of St. Louis. It took off from Roosevelt Field, where there's a mall now, in Long Island, May 20th, 1927, and he took, that was a 3,600-mile journey overseas to Paris. In the next 33 hours, the world followed the news about his flight, and it was a big fucking deal. He left on a Friday, and he landed late Saturday. Boxing matches stopped in order for people to pray for Lucky Lindy. People were calling the newspapers demanding the latest updates. Shows on Broadway gave updates during their intermission. Everybody in the world was paying attention to him. He later wrote that in 33 hours, he was worried about drinking and eating too much because like the bathroom thing. And so he got very tired and woozy, basically admitted that he was hallucinating half the time. So, yeah, so he's doing that and he's up in the air. It's a big deal. Why he wouldn't he just pee his pants. Just pee your <laughs> pants, man. There was no depends, Sonia. Just so what? Just sit <laughs> in it. It's better than hallucinating and dying. I would look, if I had to choose, I would rather pee my pants. Pee your pants than yeah. Yeah. That I mean that's but that's me. <laughs> if he if he would rather hallucinate and maybe crash that's his business well he didn't know if he was going to get lost he didn't know i mean he you know it's the first time it's ever been done i mean he's he, he is very brave to do that by the way i mean and for sure and, for sure you're all by yourself yeah so he does land and in paris just outside of the city and he was basically just as surprised as everybody else like holy shit i did it <laughs> <laughs> But, and I didn't shit myself. <laughs> Yay! Can I get to the bathroom, please? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Just runs past the crowd. <laughs> Over 100,000 people greeted him in the middle of the night to celebrate. After that, everywhere he went, he went to London, he went to Ireland, and then he went back to New York. He was greeted as a hero on both continents. And in New York City, they had the biggest ticker tape parade ever for him. And there's, it's the biggest one they've ever had since. 
Wow. He was an overnight star, very wealthy to boot. Now his mind turned to romance. He found the, you know, he wanted to find the just right partner to marry and then take everything to the next level. Did his parents go to the parade? Um, or were they like, we're busy, we're busy that day. <laughs> you know, we're not impressed. <laughs> you know what's funny is that, uh, well, no, it's not funny. His father died in 1925. This is 1927. His mother, I'm sure, was there, but they were just not demonstrative people. I mean, I don't know if yeah. you know any Nordic people. They're they're not yes. they're not exactly like huggers, you know. I just imagine her standing there and everyone's celebrating, and she's just standing there with like her arms folded. <laughs> And like all the like confetti's falling down on her, and she looks like Lieutenant Dan on New Year's <laughs> Eve. <laughs> Happy New Year, Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> That's the image I have in my head. I'm I'm going with it. it I, I like it. He did find the woman that would be perfect for him, and she really was. She was, and it was his mother. <laughs> his former roommate his mom no it was <laughs> it was a young recent smith grad her name was ann morrow she was not only smart and energetic she was also really good looking even better she was super wealthy because her dad was part of the jp morgan and company <gasps> like sonia on real like housewives of new york sonia morgan on real housewives that's my family. <laughs> awesome. She's she's amazing. So Charles's first book comes out in 1927, and it was a big, big hit. But Anne realized that she had the real writing talent in the family. She was constantly writing journals and things like that. And he thought she would be a good companion on his flight ideas. So they marry in 1929, and he taught her how to fly, and she was his co-pilot. And they traveled around the world as the it couple. And that's cool. Which is very, very cool. I mean, that's, I think that's really amazing. And everywhere they went, it was a big deal. There was a big celebration. But the thing was is that they were people who really enjoyed their privacy. The press followed them everywhere. And you just think about like in 2000 or 2004 when Benefer was first popular. And like everywhere they went. There was just cameras and everything. That's the that's like the level it was for these people. So now that he was a part of the the Morrow Morgan family, Charles was able to buy and sell stock before the common folk. So he grew a personal fortune. The press was very aggressive at the time, and the police had no problem allowing them onto things like crime scenes or inside private church services or into hospitals or into people's homes. That is so crazy to think about. It is insane. And the press could literally, they just could not get enough of him and her. And then when Anne became pregnant, they followed them around like crazy. And so they're like in the delivery room. <laughs> <laughs> Their son, Charles Augustus Lindbergh, was born in 1930. And the Lindberghs moved to Hopewell, New Jersey. And basically at the time, it was like they had a family home in Long Island. It was the Morrow home. They stayed there quite a bit. And that was where it was actually very, they, they, it was a compound. It, it was protected. This was more open, but it gave them more, they thought it gave them more privacy. And so they were building up their home in Hopewell, New Jersey. Absolutely needed the privacy because they, first of all, they give birth to a baby, which is a big deal. And then if you see pictures of this baby, it's like the cutest baby of all time. Mm. Like raising Arizona cute. Like you just, <laughs> <laughs> which I shouldn't say because what happens next is a huge yeah. fucking bummer. The first tragedy that really hits them is on March 1st, 1932, when the baby, um, Charles, the little baby, Charles, was kidnapped from his room. The parents found a ransom note in the room and there was a ladder by the window and it demanded $50,000, which is about a million dollars today. So scary. Which is terrifying. And it was written in a, in a broken English, which suggested that it was an immigrant that was behind this or immigrants. This is Charles already had a really low opinion of immigrants at this time. He was big on American exceptionalism and thought Nordic white men were superior and objected to what he thought was a lax immigration policy. 
he also even though that's how his grandfather got there exactly cool. yeah awesome he also hated the press who wrote sensational stories about him and his family what they were writing about the crime charles at the time was considered so important and so much of a hero in the u.s that the local police in new jersey let him call all the shots they don't bring in like the fbi and everybody there was at the time kidnapping wasn't considered a federal federal offense it was a local offense hmm. and so the day after this happened it became a federal offense that way you can get the fbi in there because what happens is people transport them across state lines and then yeah, you have right. that whole fucking thing well charles in his infinite wisdom hired basically a fan to be a mediator with the kidnappers which is not something cops would normally let happen. Normally the cops would take over all the communication and everything. And this mediator was a guy named Dr. John F. Condon and his nick and his initials JFC, which is what he writes everywhere, which means something completely <laughs> different now. Yes. But he used to call himself Jaffsy. JFC. Jaffsy. 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 Okay. So he would get in touch with, he was the mediator between the kidnappers and Lindbergh. And so Lindbergh got the money and it was gold plated. It had like gold lettering on it. So it was, you could track this money. And they went to a cemetery in the Bronx. Somebody took the money and Doc, and Jaffsey gave him the money. It, they just it disappeared. And then they didn't hear anything. And then a few weeks later, the body of the baby was found. It's, it's horrible what happened. So awful. It's, it's just so awful. And I, I, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. Two years later, the ransom money was traced to a Bruno Richard Hopman. And it was called the trial of the century. He was a German immigrant. He was sentenced for his part in the kidnapping. He was sentenced alone. He said he was innocent, and he never, ever said that anybody helped him or he wasn't a part of a team or anything, which is total bullshit. Right. You don't do that shit on your own. But anyway, he was sentenced to death. There are some people who felt it had to be an inside job because the Limburgs only used to stay at the residence over the weekends, and then during the week, they would be doing electricity work like that's happening at your house. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> But the baby wasn't feeling well. So he had a cold. So they decided to stay in New Jersey for a couple of nights. So nobody would actually know that unless they were in the house. They th that's one of the thoughts. I'm not saying anybody did. But I do have a, a crazy story. One of their maids was questioned. And her name, I love this name, Violet Sharp. Ooh. She was English. She had the short bobbed black hair. And she was supposed to be engaged to the butler. But she had a lot of flings in the city with the men in town. Some Downton Abbey shit right <laughs> she had now. Some Downton Abbey shit. When the police questioned her, she was very high strung. And she supposedly gave different stories like, oh, no, I was having drinks with Bob. Or, no, I was in my hair. I was washing my hair. She just had different stories. She was a very high strung woman. She got so upset, she ran upstairs and drank silver polish that had cyanide Ooh. in it. She was dead within minutes. What the fuck? Right? The police could never connect her to the crime. They think she just, it was just one of those things. Like she just was one of those upset people. Like she just. Wow. Like, yeah. And it's crazy. Would, it's Jesus a, fucking Christ. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and would later say her husband never shed any tears for their son. He refused to talk about him, was never brought up in their home again. She said the only time she saw him with tears in his eyes was when their oldest dog that they had for 20 years died. My God. Yeah. He was just a very stoic guy. By the way, that's the only time I've seen my dad cry, too. Really? Yeah. Well, someone... His dog, his, his dog died. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. We get very attached to our animals. We do. Some people have pushed the idea that Charles himself was a part of the kidnapping because his son was not 100% strong and could not walk on his own yet. There is no evidence of this. Yeah. How old was his son again? Under two. He's like a year. Oh, come months. on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
That's crazy. Okay. They were harassed by the press so badly. I mean, it was it was bad before, but once the kidnapping happened and then the trial, it was ridiculous. They couldn't travel in a car anywhere because the press would follow them and like cut them off in traffic. And so one time they sent the nanny off with their new baby, John. By the way, Anne was pregnant when this all happened. The kidnapping so, happened. So sad. It's so sad. Anne put John, the little baby John, and the nanny in a car and they were going to go for a drive. And the four photographers cut them off jump out of the car, run over to their car, and then take all these pictures of John and the nanny screaming and crying. The, what the fuck? And, who, who even wants to see that picture? Pe- it's sick, because, but people did. You know, there was a price tag to it. And so Charles and Anne hated the press. They were upset about what happened with their son, with the, you know, everything that's going on. And so Lindy, lucky Lindy and Anne, moved to Europe. They're like, this is bullshit. Let's just go away to Europe and see what's going on there. So we're in the mid 1930s and this is when Lucky Lindy learned about the growing Nazi movement in Germany. And he often took trips to Berlin, to Berlin, excuse me, to meet with Hitler and his henchmen to inspect their airfields. Yeah. Oh, I'm just meeting with Hitler. Yeah. Hitler was in the news throughout the 30s. It's he didn't show up out of nowhere. Hitler was so hot in the 30s. (laughs) (laughs) Well, people knew about him. Yeah. Let's go back a little bit. World War I was very rough on everyone that participated. It was the first war that used mustard gas, you know, chemical weapons. People came home missing limbs. It was a brutal, ugly, horrible war. And so peop- that was still on the mind of people when we were talking about possibly going into war again. Lindbergh, as I said before, he believed in a master race. He believed in eugenics. He believed that white people from Western Europe were the de facto person and every other race was lesser than. So because of this, he did not believe in democracy. He did not believe every citizen should have the right to vote. And he preferred fascism over communism. This is sounding so familiar. Right? Huh. He thought that Jewish people were a lesser race than of people than other people. He also thought Russians were in, were inferior because they have Asian slash mongoloid blood. Fuck this guy. He had lesser feelings for Asian people in general, and thought if people just allowed white men to take charge, everything would just sort itself out. Oh, fuck this guy! <laughs> fuck this guy. He might have first learned about this back when he was at the University of Wisconsin with his mom. Sorry, sorry, (laughs) University of Wisconsin. I'm sure you're nicer now. Oh, I'm sure it's a great school. This is in the mid-1920s. And the the, the idea of eugenics was actually starting to take off. And the idea of that was if you get rid of people who are, let's quote unquote, weaker in some way, you'll just keep breeding up. People just get better and better. If you weed out people, let's say, that are blind or not white or what, you know what I mean? Or, or, yes, right. That's what that, so there were several pieces of legislation in the 1920s throughout America that legalized the sterilization of the socially unfit. Uh, mainly it's that is so fucked up. It is incredibly fucked up. You could be committed to a hospital for any reason and then somebody could just sterilize you. These laws were not taken off the books until the 1970s. This is how long it happened. Yeah. And by the way, our past administration, when we were holding people at the border, Mm -hmm. we did this. Some people in our government did this to some of the women they were keeping at the borders. Like, this isn't even something that doesn't happen anymore. It was happening here. It's fucked up. And it's wrong. In 1924, the Immigration Act limited races coming to America, such as Asian, uh, people who are Jewish, 
and people from Southern and Eastern Europe. Nope, not good enough. Mm -mm. As Lindy and Anne are going through Europe and Asia during the 1930s, they were particularly disturbed. They weren't big fans of Britain. Charles thought they were a little effete. Uh, he thought they were a little effeminate. They like their tea. He thought they were just too proper, dandyish. And he was particularly disturbed, they said, when they went to India because of the, the mass poverty. He figured that England can't solve these things colonizing places. And the only thing to do is to just basically get rid of the people who aren't white. And he said, one of his observations, we whites were so accustomed to dominating that it was difficult to realize that we were in a minority of yellow, brown, and black. Like being around people that weren't white kind of blew their minds. Then he goes, this guy's such a fucking asshole. And, you know, and she's with him. She totally, yeah, yeah they, they were attached to the hip. He goes to Berlin in the 1930s. This is like when Cabaret is set, the movie musical. Mm -hmm. His mind was blown at how amazing Germany was in comparison. He and Anne didn't mind so much seeing all the anti-Jewish signs everywhere. They thought this was yes, the place fine. of the future. Yes, yeah. Charles said their sense of decency and values is in many ways far ahead of our own. He accepted awards from Hitler and shook his hand. He told the German media, whom he trusted to tell the truth over any other media, that Germany had a superior air force, that no other country should even bother to try go against them, even though they are now steamrolling through Europe. Also at this time, believe it or not, I don't know, I didn't know this, Charles was interested in creating artificial body parts. He was always interested in how things worked, including the human body and the organs. And he became friends with a man, a Frenchman, who was a doctor, Alexis Carroll. They worked together to de develop the first artificial heart. So that was like one of his hobbies was also that. Also, interesting hobby. Very interesting hobby. Also, he was an early proponent for rocket ships. And he was a supporter of a man named Dr. Robert Goddard, who's considered basically like the godfather of the space program. Back in America, oh. in the late 30s, there was a growing debate about what to do about Hitler. Lindbergh had, once again, no problem with fascism. And he felt that America had absolutely no right to interfere. He said publicly many times, America would lose in a war, in a, an air war with Germany. It wasn't worth doing. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was concerned about Germany and how fascism would affect American life. FDR and, and Lindy basically had a frenemy kind of relationship. Like they were nice to each other, but Lindbergh didn't trust him. And, and FDR was worried that Lindbergh, Lindbergh, who was still popular in the American public, would go into politics because I was he was going to do exactly the opposite of what FDR wanted to do. Right. Lindbergh didn't believe in the new deals of FBR, FDR, excuse me, and he was against allowing Jews around Europe seeking asylum in the U.S. He said, there were plenty of them here. We do not need more. He was unmoved. I hate him. <laughs> he was unmoved about stories of people being kicked from their homes and businesses. He thought Jewish people were lesser than and not worth getting into war over. At this time, there's a growing movement in America, and at this time I mean 1939-1940. This group was called, get ready for it, America First. Oh, that sounds familiar too. Huh. It was started by a great many people. That, uh, I almost had a million members at, at one point. It started at Yale University by President Gerald Ford. Jesus Christ. Sergeant Shriver, who would help create the Peace Corps, and future Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart. Also, Walt Disney had a flirtation with it for a while. They held rallies around America. They sold out the garden, Madison Square Garden. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people would show up. They would hold these rallies to, to rival Nazi rallies. So when you see a Nazi rally, you see all the Nazi flags and everyone's holding yeah. the flags, you know, st st stiffly. And then you have like a picture of Adolf Hitler all blown up and everything. They would do the same thing, except it was American flags. And George Washington was the iconic 
iconography. Lindbergh gave speeches around the country. He joined them right away, was extolling the virtues of isolationism and neutrality. He complained that the Jewish media was telling a one-sided story and that common enemies of America were the British, Jews, and war profiteers. History is repeating itself. It's totally, 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 there totally. No new ideas. The America First program was so popular. It gained in popularity so damn quickly that they had a really hard time keeping track of their members. And members of the KKK and anti-Semitic groups started joining and then taking over the groups in their towns. Great. Mm -hmm. In September of 1941... Limburg gave a very fiery speech in Des Moines, Iowa, and that served as the beginning of his downfall. He accused three groups of pressing this country towards war, the British, the Jewish, and the Roosevelt administration. It is not difficult to understand why Jewish people desire the overthrow of Nazi Germany. The persecution they suffer in Germany would be sufficient in, to make bitter enemies of any race. Nobody with any sense of dignity and of mankind can condone, can condone the persecution of Jewish race in Germany. But no person of honesty and vision could look at their pro-war policy here today without seeing the dangers involved in such a policy for both us and for them. Basically, yeah, it sucks, but what are you going to do? Yeah, what are you going to do? Shrug. Shrug. Shrug emoji. We, we don't have to pay for that. He right. said, I'm not attacking Jewish or British people. I like both races. But he basically was saying it's too expensive. We can't let our, our you know, heads rule our hearts and that kind of our hearts rule our heads, that kind of thing. Like, yeah, it's an atrocity, but it's worse to send people over and have them die. You know, and that's what happens in a war. That is, some, right. you know, so is it worth paying? You know, there was the lend lease program that FDR was really into, which is basically let's lend weapons to England so they can fucking defend themselves and just charge them a small fee. And he and, and Lindbergh was like, no, no, don't give him anything. Lindbergh's mother, mother-in-law and mother, they were staying with her in Long Island and the mother was disgusted by all of this Good. and told her daughter, I don't know what you see. I mean, this is this is terrible. And, and this is very rich lady. But she would collect clothes and, and, and things for kids that were refugees that were, you know, that were stuck in different camps or and Anne refused to help her mother pack these things because mm. she said to her mother, no, we have to remain neutral. And her Why? mother was like, <laughs> fuck that. So, yeah. yeah, good for her. Yeah. This is when the shit started hitting the fan for him. For some reason, him just saying all that finally got people worked up. People started saying he was an enemy of the U.S. So there were streets that were named after him that were taken down. FDR took away his, um, his uh, he was in the Air Force. He took that away from him. For some reason, openly condemning British and Jewish people was not accepted. Huh. Yeah, it's almost like it's wrong. It's almost as if it's a terrible thing to do. So soon yeah. after that, there was a little thing called the bombing at Pearl Harbor. It's a little. really shitty movie if you ever <laughs> are interested. Yeah, don't. There's documentaries. You yes, <laughs> do that. <laughs> we will do Pearl Harbor. Harbor the movie for dorking out someday. Someday when we actually that's when we went to war. So we went to war against Germany, but then we also went to war against Japan. And Ed, and Lindbergh was like. I'm not going to fight against Germany, but man, do I hate Asian people. So I will oh fight against Japan. I'm so torn. And FDR is like, fuck you. No, I don't trust you. I don't trust yeah. that you're going to do the right thing. I don't trust that you'll be, you'll stand by people. So Henry Ford, very successful man, also an anti-Semite, also will probably be on the show one day. Yes, Started will. the Ford Motor Company. He had different businesses around the country. He was taking over these, these hangers, and he was, like, creating products for war. And so he hired Lindy. And then Lindy started advising for, for air combat. And eventually he did f get to fight in Japan, and he flew a bunch of bombing missions. And a funny thing happens... FDR dies in the spring of 1945 when the war is just about to end. And by the time of VJ Day, Victory Over Japan, 
Lindy was considered a hero again. It all went away. He cancel culture in action. Yes. <laughs> His big enemy was no longer the president, so he didn't worry about it. What happened was the government sent him after the war was over, they sent him to Germany and said, get as many scientists as, as you can. Because even though Russia was our ally in World War II, there was still the big fear of communism. This is the space race. So Lindbergh goes to Germany and gets a bunch of German scientists. And some of these guys did experiments on people and basically said, we'll give you a clean slate. That'll be off your record. Just come to the U.S. and pledge your allegiance to the U.S. and start a space program. And they all were like, yep, I'm totally on board with that. Mm. When he was done signing those guys up, someone, some felt that you really should visit concentration camps. You really need to see what happened here. And Lindbergh was bummed out by what he saw. It's a super bummer, yeah. <laughs> he really was like, man, he decided that what caused all this was not bigotry. It was the dependence on science. And that science was the enemy of religion. And so after this, and after he helped with the space program, he basically turned his attention to the environment. And in the 50s and the 60s, he has a huge, massive, successful book called The Spirit of St. Louis. It earns him the Pulitzer Prize. It's a Jimmy Stewart movie. Jimmy mm -hmm. Stewart, 50-something, playing a 20-something Lindbergh. It's a little weird. Yeah. Also, Charles Lindbergh doesn't deserve a Jimmy Stewart performance. No, he Just does not. He and Anne moved to Darien, Connecticut, which is like a nice shishi part of Connecticut, and then later on moved to Maui. Anne would go on to he would go on to have five more kids with Anne. She would write a bunch of books. They kind of lived a little more quiet life. He would start to t he was more paying attention now to nature versus science. So he was going to all these conservation things around the world, and he was a massive control freak. And one of the things that he did with Anne is he always was constantly giving her lists, like to-do lists. And mm -hmm. what he would do is, this is around 1957, he started just taking off for months. He would just be gone two, three months and say to Anne, I'll be back, I'll let you know when I'm coming back. But when I come back, I need this, this, and this done. And he did that with all of his kids. The kids said that basically when he was gone, they had a great time. It's right. Anne was you know, a good parent. She wasn't like a, a control freak of a parent. She kind of let them do what they wanted to do. They were Would living she in a nice them? house. Yes. Oh, what? She was a great mom. They loved her. And they said as soon as he showed up, it was like all buttoned up. Yes, sir. No, sir. Mm -hmm. No hugs. No any of this shit. I mean, they all, it's their father. They love him. But, you know, he, they just thought he was a, a, an authoritarian. They thought he yeah, wasn't very, yeah. didn't have a lot of heart. He dies of cancer in 1972, and true to his ways, Lindbergh planned his death and funeral down to every single detail. He's buried in Maui. With his mom? Please tell me with his mom. <laughs> Sadly, no. No, with a dog. Oh, no, damn it. The family went on, and Anne would be later celebrated as a writer. And then something funny happens in the summer of 2003. There's a big bombshell that happens in the Lindbergh family. And mainly that when he was gone for all of those months and all of those years and all those holidays, the kids would know that he was going to be there for Christmas or not. Like he just was that absent and, and, and would never tell people. He was so, so secretive. It turns out it's because he had three mistresses I in Germany it. and he had children with all of them. He had secret families because I knew it. true to his belief of a master race, mm -hmm. he wanted to give birth to as many German kids as he could. So in 1957, he fell in love with a then 31 year old Brigitte Hassheimer. He had three kids with her. At the same time, he had a relationship with her sister, Marietta, and had <gasps> two kids with her. Then he had an affair with his private secretary, Valeska, and they had two and they, kids together. Oh, my gosh. 
So all this time, he's keeping everybody informed about his upcoming death. And he had secret bank accounts set aside for the women to take care of the kids. He had different post office boxes and he would constantly be changing them. How exhausting. It's uh, the level of deception you know, to do all this. In 2003, when one of the women died, her kids came forward. I think it's uh, the first one, Brigitte. When she died, the kids came forward and they had DNA testing. And they all tested for his, you know, their, their, his progeny. They came forward and said they weren't allowed to say anything until she died. They, do, they knew nothing about his family in America. He kept everything super close to the vest. So this is all like he was the family man and everything. His kids didn't find out until 2003 that their dad had all these other kids in another country. And so some of them, you know, some people take it better than others. But anyway, that's our creep today, Charles Lindbergh. Great job, Margo. What a fucking creep. Seriously, what a fucking creep. I know, right? Such a creep. I didn't know a lot of that stuff. I mean, I obviously I know who he is, but I didn't know a lot of the details. What a fucking gross creep. Yeah, we we keep everything in our show notes. I put all the links there so you can learn about it yourself. But there you go, Charles Lindbergh. Good job. Thank you. Would you like to hear about someone who's not a creep? I definitely would. Okay. I was going to talk about Sully Sun- Sullenberg. Mm -hmm. also known as Captain Chelsea Burnett Sullenberg III. He is a retired Air Force fighter pilot and airline captain, and he's probably best known for the miracle on the Hudson. Uh, On January 15th in 2009, he was flying for U.S. Airways, I believe. I don't have it in my... Where is it? Holy crap! Uh, I believe that's what it was. They took off, and not very long after they took off, they hit a flock of geese, flew right into the engines, and they had to do this crazy water landing. And they landed in the New York City Hudson River, and like I said, it's known as the Miracle on the Hudson. It was like a minute after they took off from LaGuardia Airport, and it was U.S. Airways. I was right. Here it is in my notes. (laughs) Ta-da. They lost it power in both engines and he was just like Mr. Calm, Mr. Collected. He called it in. They were like, you need to turn around and head back to the airport or go to this. They tried to direct him to another airport and he just calmly informed them it's all on you know on tape. He says that he was unable to reach a runway. And then he said, We're going we're gonna be in the Hudson. He said it like super simply, like we're gonna be in the Hudson. And then he told there was a hundred and 50 passengers and five crew members on the plane. And he just told them to brace for impact. He did. He landed it in the water. It was so cold. It's 40 degrees. That's fucking cold. Oh yeah. I like, remember. I, dude, I get in a pool that's like 50. Yeah. You, know, you get in a pool that's like 70 and you're like, why is it so cold? 40 degrees. So cold. So that's five degrees Celsius. I looked it up for our, our listeners outside of the U S so all the people who were on the bo- on the on the plane were rescued. No, some injuries, but nobody died. And then after they evacuated everyone from the plane, he actually. The, by the way, the plane's filling up with water. He is. He walked up and down the aisles twice before he, he was the last one to leave the sinking plane. Good for like him. I think that that's amazing. He made sure everyone was safe. I think that it's so cool. And obviously after this happened, and by the way, it was caught on camera, like every news organization was covering it. So it was like a really big deal. I remember it being on like every TV, everywhere you went, people were watching this happen. So after it happened, Time Magazine named him as one of the most influential heroes and icons of 2009. And he was awarded like the French Legion of Honor. He met George George W. Bush. He met Barack Obama. There was a movie called Sully. Sorry, come on. Tom Hanks played him in a movie. That's like the biggest honor ever. It's a Clint Eastwood movie. It is a Clint Eastwood fucking creep. But Tom <laughs> Hanks isn't a creep. And here's one of the things I wanted to call out that I thought was so great. So in Sully's luggage on the plane was a library book. 
he it was called like just culture balancing safety and account and accountability and it was a like i said library book the a salvage crew actually found his luggage and found the book and sully contacted the library and Aww. said i have my book but it's water damaged <laughs> <laughs> and then they waived the late fees <laughs> Which I I just think it's amazing that he even thought of that. And then Mayor Bloomberg gave him like a key to the city. You know, he got him a new copy of the book, <laughs> which I thought was really cool. He co-authored a memoir with this guy, Jeffrey Aslow. And the book is called Highest Duty, My Search for What Really Matters. And it's all about the crash and things like that. But he talks a lot about like personal stuff too, including it. So his father actually killed himself. He committed suicide in 1995. And because of that, Sully has been using his platform now as someone who really talks about like suicide prevention. He goes to like schools and corporations and nonprofit organizations, and he does all this public speaking. And he talks a lot about suicide prevention. And he works with like organizations like National Suicide Prevention Week and National Suicide Prevention Lifeline all about like helping people like his dad who had a lot of depression, but didn't know how to get the services he needed Mm -hmm. to help him. And I just think that's, you know, it's so sad. Um, He is, he's married to a former fitness instructor named uh, Lori. They adopted two daughters together. Like I said, he's now he works as an international speaker. So he, like he said, he speaks to schools and corporations, nonprofits. He talks a lot about aviation and patient safety, performing under pressure, like those kinds of crisis management and just trying to live your life with integrity, which I think is a wow. really, a really cool thing. Just by all accounts, like a good human being. Do they live I in just, Danville? I think they do now. He grew up in Texas, but I believe he lives. I think he lives in Danville now. I think you're right. Danville, California, where my parents used yeah. to live. Oh my yeah. gosh. That's, I yeah. remember that about him. I, and I saw the movie. Yeah. It, it, it's a good movie. Like yeah. not to like sit here and like review the movie Sully, but it's, it's difficult to tell a gripping story when you already know the ending. <laughs> exactly. And so I, you know, tip of the hat to making that movie as as thrilling as you can be when you know that it's basically got a happy ending. And I think when you've got Tom Hanks, you know, <laughs> half your work is done. By all, like I said, by all accounts, a decent human being. And I, I'm just always so impressed with him when I see him. Like sometimes he goes on news after plane crashes and things like that. He speaks so eloquently about the pressures of flying and about the things that can go wrong when you're flying. Yeah, and like he's landing in the Hudson. Like landing in the Hudson. And he's he's awesome. He is definitely not, not a creep. So known as, known as Sully, uh, <laughs> but his name is actually Captain Chelsea Burnett Sullenberg III. Great choice, Sonia. Thank you. I love Sully. He's great. He is great. Well, that's our show today, you guys. Thank you so much for being patient. Sorry, we got yes. a little bit late. So ho- hopefully Sonia's home will be ready sooner than later. <laughs> Mercury's fingers in retrograde for a little bit longer, but fingers crossed. Think- send your good juju to her. If you Please. have any ideas for creeps and or non-creeps, we always are looking for those. Follow us on all the social media things. We love it when you use the gif of Annie Potts in Ghostbusters. We got one. Or just think of something for yourselves. Once again, if you would like some stickers, email us at whatacreeppodcast at gmail.com. <laughs> Join our Patreon page. Just, you know, thank you so much for listening to the show. We really, really appreciate it. And we hopefully have something special coming up with another podcast something's in the works you know we're sending it out into the universe so you guys just kind of keep a keep on top of that for for a little bit and uh, a mystery it's a mystery so sonia where can they find you you can find me at my parents house or (laughs) at (laughs) or at the sonia show.com and the sonia show on twitter and instagram and tiktok where i'm there just to ruin it for the young people where are you margo 
You can find me on social media at Brooklyn Fitchick, mostly for Twitter and Instagram. My blog is brooklynfitchick.com. In the meantime, everybody, wear your masks when you're going in out of buildings. Be nice to each other. Be kind. Don't be a dick. Don't be a creep. Creep. Thank you for listening to us talk about creeps. You can follow us at What a Creep Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But don't follow us too closely. You can email us your creepy stories at whatacreeppodcast at gmail.com. But please keep your dick pics to yourself. <laughs> Thank you.